Only Sky Sports is on course with three top golf tournaments at the weekend. First up is the prestigious French Open from Paris, the next stop on the European Tour. Oh, I don't believe it! Then it's stateside where golfing legends assemble for a major event, the Senior Players Championship. While Nick Price defends his title from the likes of Greg Norman at the $1 million Greater Hartford Open. How good is that? Three events, four days of transatlantic golf starting Thursday at 2 on Sky Sports. In a town like Twin Peaks, no one is innocent. The net of destruction is closing in. What is it, Mona? What's wrong? I love you. The last seven days of Laura Palmer. Dad! Who was that? You and I are going to make a big score tonight. Inspired by the highly acclaimed television series, Twin Peaks, the premiere. Tonight at 10 on the movie channel. From the Sky Satellite Network, this is Sky Sports. Having put Ron Platt on the right track, there's trouble and strife for Tim as he continues his Highland adventure. I wonder if Barter will be a hit with the missus. In the academy, Ken trims young David's clubs down to size in an effort to make him a cut above the rest. You can play the shots, but are still not getting the desired results. Beverly embarks on course management. And if you can't manage to find the greens, Mickey's here with some fringe benefits. And the housewife's favourite, Charles Downey, once again, flips the pages of the rulebook. Now, a few weeks ago on Sky Sports, we saw Roger Maltby winning the first ever memorial in Columbus, Ohio, wearing a pair of trousers very similar to these. And I figure if it works for him, it will work for me. <laughs> now, before we go to the lesson this week, we've had a lot of letters from our viewers in the mailbag about people who can knock it in from four feet quite comfortably, get down in two from 45 feet, but they're still having terrible trouble around the greens chipping. Well, don't despair. What you need to do is get yourself one of these, the Bronte Pitchmaster. It really is just a putter with loft, and north of the border, we call it the jigger. So all you have to do is set the club up on the line you want the ball to start, take up your putting style, and from there, simply putt the ball. Let the loft on the club do the work. That will take it over the uneven ground or the apron onto the putting surface, and then from there, it's rather like a long putt. You let the contours take effect and nurse the ball up to the hole. Let's see if we can do that. So get your club pointing in the line, the direction you want the ball to start in. Take up your putting grip. It may be the normal one or the reverse overlap where this forefinger is down the fingers of the right hand. And then from there, don't try and lift the ball. Let the loft of the club do the work and send it on its way. So there you are, it's as simple as that. Now this club has some 45 degrees of loft in it, so there's more shots you can play than just the normal chip and run. And throughout the programme this week, we'll take a look and see what we can do with it. Well now it's over to the range at Glen Eagles and Tim Barters in the company of Ron Platt's better half, Jackie. Well Jackie, the first thing I'm going to do is have a little look at your grip in closer detail. We can see here that from this face on position you can barely see the second knuckle on this left hand that means that it's turned slightly underneath what we call a weak position okay so we're going to take the right hand away because that one's basically sand so let's take that one away and have a look at the inside of this left hand if you open your hand up for me you can see that the club's running pretty much across the middle of your palm there and very little of this fleshy pad the heel pad of your hand is getting on top of the club that heel pad provides tremendous support during the swing and actually helps you to use your wrists more effectively so we need to establish the club a little bit lower in your palm. It's going to run from the middle joint of your index finger across into the base of your palm here, where that first crease is. So let's just lay the club into there and get you to close your hand around the club nicely. And now you can see that much more of that heel pad is resting on top of the club, and your wrist, therefore, is much more able to hinge. Okay? Yeah. In fact, a good little check for you there, if you actually make your grip for me there again, 
A good little check is just to let go with everything but this index finger, all the three fingers off the club and indeed the thumb, and the club should just rest under the pad and over the finger. Where it was before, up in the middle of the palm, have a little go at holding it there and you'll see that you soon lose it. And it's the cause actually of a lot of people wearing the glove out in that area, so it's something that um, will save you a few pounds in gloves if you can sort out. So low in the palm, closing the hand round the club, getting that heel pad much more on top, and then we can get cracking on getting those wrists working better in the swing. Okay? okay. So we're going to give you a few minutes to get comfortable with that, and then we'll have a look more detail at your swing. Tim and Jackie in full swing there on the range. Now, before the lesson, we had a chat about this chip master. And because of the wide sole, if you do get a bare lie, it's able to bounce, and therefore it's not going to dig in. Now, how often do you find yourself like this? by the edge of a bunker where everybody's walked off the edge of the green and you can see there no grass under the ball at all as bare as you could ever wish to see the last thing you want to do is put a sand wedge behind that especially if you have no confidence in chipping so again take your chip master remember 45 degrees of loft and that's sufficient to carry this bunker lift it onto the green and then let it run to the hole you have no options here but to try it you can put it through the trap and you don't want to knock it over there because you'll be knocking it further from the hole. Let's give this a whittle. Really is a horrible lie too, I'll tell you. Can't say I'm looking forward to it. Well, it's not absolutely stone dead, but it's near enough to have a chance of a four, and the worst I can do is a five. Well, this may cut your scores down on the academy, Ken has a hacksaw in his hands, and he's cutting something else. I see you've brought your, your friend Stuart in to watch us. Yep. Shaft off. Let's see if we can break it off. See, when, when you're on the tour, you're always doing little adjustments to your clubs. There we are perhaps slightly changing the weight or different thicknesses of grip, so you're always yeah. fiddling around, maybe making them a bit heavier, a bit lighter. Does that, just that little bit of weight matter? Uh, well, by shortening the club, you completely change the, the, the overall swing weight. You see, not only is it a bit shorter now, it actually makes it swing a bit lighter. And you actually, yeah. that's a very good point, because although we've shortened it, I think this will be ideal for you, but a lot of youngsters also need a light-headed club, because it, although it might be the right length, the head may still be that much too heavy. Make sure it's home there. Just feel that, be careful because it's, it's going to be still a bit slippery and a bit greasy. Just Thanks. Oh yeah, it's better because yeah, it's better be. Well here's this club we've cut down, David. Give it a try. Yeah. See how it feels. That's it, aim up at that yellow flag there. Very good, very good. So Jackie, you're doing very well. We've got the grip organized a little bit better. We've got that left hand slightly more through the base of your palm. And now you can easily see two knuckles on that left hand when you pick it up. And that's a good checkpoint for you. When it was too much through the palm, you could only see one knuckle. Now that it's going through the base of the palm and the left hand's over, more in its natural hanging position, you can see two knuckles, and that's very good. That's going to help us to use those wrists a little bit better in the swing. Because you complained of hitting the ball along the ground when it wasn't behaving. You hit a lot of nice shots, but the ones you did miss hit didn't tend to get airborne. And the problem was that you were trying to do the job of the club. As you swung, you tended perhaps not to make quite such a good wrist cock in the backswing. You tended to keep it a bit stiff-wristed, perhaps keep a bit tight hold on the club. But most particularly as you came into the ball, there was a tendency for you to try to pull the ball off the ground. So it looked as though as you came in, you felt that it was your job to pull that ball off the ground by pulling your arms towards you. I think you'd also suffered from a little bit of bad advice, so you can go and have a go at the husband, because I know he told you to keep the head down. And that's bad advice, to be honest. It's advice offered to people who believe that the problem is, as you've swung the club, you've lifted your head, and that's the reason for you catching the top of the ball. But I think you'll see very clearly on the film that we took of you earlier on that it's this tendency to try to pull the ball off the ground that was the problem and not the head. So we need to persuade you that the golf club can lift the ball for you. And eventually we're going to get you to having made your nice 
contact with the ball and return the club to its natural position at the base of the ball to allow that head to come through and you can enjoy watching the shot rather than looking quite so much at the ground. So the exercise I've set up for you to start with is we've hit some balls off tees and we've also made some swings at just tees alone because when you set up to this tee you don't have quite such a strong instinct to lift. Your instinct is more so brushing the grass and hitting the tee, can you see? So I can brush that tee out of the ground. And we've had a little go at that for 10 or 15 minutes and you've started to get the feel of the club swinging more freely and finding the grass and allowing the loft of the club to hit the ball airborne rather than trying to encourage it yourself. So let's put you in here and let you have a couple of goes at that for me. We've put the ball on a tee to start with just to make it nice and straightforward for you. And we'll have a little practice swing just at the tee to begin with. That should take away that instinct to lift. So that's good, the left hand gone a little bit more over than it was. And we gave you a little bit more room at setup as well. So just, if you make your address position there, that's good. We did a posture exercise where we let the arms relax there. A nice tip over, down from the hips to the ground. Just edge your way into the ball there. That's good, okay. So just a nice, relatively economical swing. We're gonna try and make a swing where the wrists hinge a little bit earlier in the swing, and then the club's allowed to free wheel into the ball and hopefully find that tee peg and brushing it out of the ground. So, you have a little go. Nice little hinge, good. Brush, okay, try one more. A Little bit heavy. Feet nice and close together there, make it easy on the mobility, that's good. And just a nice little hinge in the backswing and then let that club free wheel. Very good, okay, let's have a go at the ball. But here again, I want you to be thinking only of hitting the tee, not of lifting the ball, remember that isn't your job. Just a fairly economical swing, brush, very good. And you can see that you actually disturbed the tee and the ball got airborne very happily. I know we're working on a tee to start with, but the fact that you disturbed it means that your club did arrive back at the base of the ball rather than as it used to, lifting up a little bit and that was the cause of the top. So we're going to give you a few more minutes to work at that and then we'll see whether we can get that head turning through and you enjoying the shots. Well done. Okay, thank you. Over the last two weeks, Jackie and Ron Platt plucked from obscurity and their television stars right here on Sky Sports. Well, these are just a few of the letters from up and down the country in the last fortnight that we look forward to dealing with. Very interesting they are too, so keep them coming in. But as you can see by the thickness of the pile here, it's impossible to answer them all personally. But I promise you, we do enjoy reading them, and it's you that give us the ideas for this series, Get Your Handicap Down. Well, from Birmingham, Patrick Conkling wrote to me, 73 years of age, and he says he's passed his sell-by date. Patrick, that's never the truth. But you do have a problem hitting six inches behind your irons and your woods and it's pretty obvious that the weight must be on your right side so try and get that weight transferred onto the left foot and if you can do that you'll make your swing wider on the left hand side of the ball and all that problem with the divots will disappear another letter we had from mr sharples from wigan and he has the opposite problem he skies all his iron shots with no distance and it happens with his woods as well well, your problem obviously is that you're too steep into the ball and you don't have a shallow enough angle of attack. So from there, we need a little more shoulder turn, a bit more weight transference onto the right side on the way back, and then let the reverse happen on the way through. And rather like Mr. Conklin, get that weight onto the left side and get the torso facing the target. There's many, many more letters here that I would love to answer, and we will do before the series runs out in October. But for the moment, it's time for a short break. We'll be answering some of your problems in part two, so join us for that. You're watching Sky Sports. The action hots up in game seven of the NBA Finals. Yeah! The Houston Rockets and the New York Knicks have played their hearts out. It's three all. One game will now decide the destiny of the NBA championship. Game seven, Thursday morning at two, live on Sky Sports. Welcome back to Get Your Handicap Down. Well, while you've been away on the break, I've been fiddling about with this pitch master, this jigger as we call it, and it's quite amazing the things you can do with it. Here I've got a bunker in front of me and the pin's just 12 feet or so on the green and it's downhill all the way to the hole. So I need to play what they call a parachute shot and if you've regular viewers of Sky Sports on the US PGA Tour coverage, you will have heard the commentators talking about that. It's when you get the ball elevated quickly and it lands on the green like a butterfly with sore feet. That's the theory. Let's try it. Well, 
Well, how about that, eh? Not too bad. Now, if you're just off the dance floor and you don't have a hazard in front of you, many of you like to use the putter. Well, here's Mickey Walker with a few tips for you. A very useful shot to consider if your ball is just lying off the edge of the green on the fringe is to use your putter. If the ground between your ball and the green is fairly even, and most greens, they actually have an apron to them where the, the grass is just a little bit longer than the grass on the green, then I would suggest that you would use your putter from this position. It's a very reliable shot, a good percentage shot. If you slightly miss it, you're still going to get your ball some way close to the hole and give yourself a chance for getting down in two. A good thing to note is that you have the option whether or not to leave the pin in the hole when you're putting off the green. If you feel you can hole it and that the pin is actually going to impede your ball going in the hole, then have the pin out. But if you feel the pin is a bit of a backstop and it's a benefit, then have it left in. And one of the things that I feel is very important, the grass here, as I've said, it's a little bit longer than the grass on the green. You want to feel that you take the weight of the putter in your hands. What I don't want to see happen is that you're actually pressing the putter head into the ground. Then you're liable to snag the putter as you take it back. So feel as if your putter is hovering on top of the grass just behind the ball. That way, when you make your stroke, there's not going to be any resistance with the slightly longer grass. Well, that wasn't the best putt in the world, but I have given myself a chance to hole out. I'm just going to hit a few putts to that hole just to try and get the feel a bit better. See if I can do, make a better job of this one. slightly better pace. When you are practicing, whatever you're practicing, it's a good, good thing to vary your target. If I stood here for 10 minutes and kept hitting putt after putt, I'm sure I could get very close to that pin. But obviously when you're on the course, you only have one opportunity. So you want to vary your targets when you practice. And so I'm not going to stand here for a long time just hitting putt after putt to that pin. I'm going to vary where I putt to. So now I'm going to try a slightly shorter one to this closer pin. Well, I'd be quite happy with that one. So remember, if you are just off the fringe of the green, the Texas wedge, as it's known in golf, that is using your putter from just off the edge, is a very good shot to try. Well, I've been practicing what Mickey's been preaching, albeit with a, a very different implement. But if it's not shot making that's your problem, it could be course management. Here's Beverly. When you're going out for your round of golf, and most of us only get to play once, maybe twice a month, make sure you give yourself the right kind of preparation. Don't go rushing to the first tee like these three chaps, straight from the car park, on the golf course. Not even really a good practice swing. Tee the ball up and make a quick swing. You just end up hitting the ball not very well and putting yourself in kind of a bad humour for the start of your round. So do yourself a favour. Just give yourself half an hour for a little bit of warm-up before you play. It is very important before you play golf to do some practice to get limbered up. It's also very important to have the right kind of mental attitude. The very good American player Nancy Lopez used to have a little phrase she used to say to herself, play happy. And I'd like all of you to think about playing happy. Go out on the golf course and look forward to playing the good shots and don't think and don't get too worried about playing the bad shots. It is amazing how if we concentrate on where we don't want the ball to go to, it often goes there. I mean, how many times have you heard someone say, I just knew I was going to hit it there? Well, if you know you're going to hit it there, chances are that's exactly where you are going to hit it. When you come to the tee, look down the fairway and have a good look at what's down there. Obviously, there's bunkers and rough and trees that you want to avoid, but there's also a lot of fairway that you can hit onto. Concentrate on where you want the ball to go and don't worry about where you don't want the ball to go. 
Every good player that I know has a pre-shot routine. And in that pre-shot routine, they're making sure they define where their target is and they're making sure they take good aim at that target. For this shot, I'm going to aim just over the edge of the pathway and try and get my ball to fly down the right-hand side of the fairway towards the little copse of trees right at the bottom. As I come behind the ball, I make sure that I'm aligned over a spot directly en route to my target. I make sure my club face is aimed correctly at my target and that my body line is parallel to where I want to go. Have a good look before you swing at where you want to go. Don't take too long, just make a nice rhythm swing. So remember folks, be positive about your golf. Enjoy it. Think about the good shots you're going to hit and don't worry about the bad ones. Just make your ordinary setup for me. And this is the sort of thing you can do just in the garden again, just for five or ten minutes a day, just to familiarise yourself with the movement. So here, swinging the club away, trying to get those wrists working a little bit earlier in the swing. So we've got a nice hinge there and you've retained the angle in your spine. You haven't stood up at all, you've kept a nice spine angle. From there, the club's going to swing down nicely, not allowing it to lift and try and help the ball in the air. We're going to let that club swing right back to the grass. And then as you go through the ball, rather than keeping the head down and the arms struggling to get through, we're going to let the eyes turn up and enjoy the shot. And you come through into a nice balanced finish. That's very good. Put you on the front of a magazine with that one, I reckon. OK, let's have a look and see whether we can perhaps get you to hit one or two away like that. So just nice and relaxed, make a comfortable setup. Just a fraction further away from it. Remember our little posture exercise. That's good. Nice relaxed arms, tipping over, gentle flex of the knees. OK, nice relaxed swing and see whether you can see the end result. Very good. Well done. Well, you've done brilliantly. We've uh, not been at it very long and already you've managed to get the ball away quite a lot more successfully. So I hope uh, that with a little practice in the garden, you might just get that handicap down. I'm often asked which rule of golf has broken the most often. There's no question in my mind that it's when golfers take a wrong drop away from an obstruction. Here we have a very common situation where the ball is next to a staked tree. What I have to do here, first of all, is I have to establish if there actually is interference. I'm playing in this direction and it's pretty obvious that here things are in my way. So what I must do is I must find the nearest point of relief where I no longer have interference for my lie, my stance or my swing. In this case, with me being a right-handed golfer, I think it's about here. If I was a left-handed player, the situation might be quite different. So I'm going to mark this point, and then I'm going to measure one club length from here. And I must drop the ball within that spot. That ball's now in play. Now, unless your club has a different local rule, that's the procedure you must adopt. We don't measure the interference from the stake. We measure the club length from the nearest point of relief. It's perfectly permissible that you may drop your ball from the rough onto the fairway, so long as you're dropping within the rules. So, choose your nearest point of relief, drop correctly, and then we're all playing to the same rule. Whale. Nice club, 8 out of 10. This is a driver by Wilson, a System 45. Overall, I think I'd give that one 9 out of 10. The house in Hippo Plus. Very impressed with it, 9 out of 10. The Killer Whale by Wilson. Probably 8 out of 10. This is a tailor-made burner plus. For me, this one, 7 out of 10. It's an old hairy button. It's got a persimmon head. So out of 10, I suppose I'll give it 7.5. Now, I know I said I would leave the killer whale to Ken Brown, but 
I just can't resist giving this a good smash down the middle of this practice ground. And I would give this one 9 out of 10. We'll be looking at some more drivers for you next week, but it's this club this week that's intrigued me. It has the same sole as a sand iron, so there's no real reason why it shouldn't work in the bunker. Let's have a crack. Oh, fantastic little shot there, and that's near enough for me to make my pal. Well, that's just about it. Time has beaten us once again here on Get Your Handicap Down. It's been wonderful having your company. It's also been lovely answering your letters, and there'll be more of the same next week. But from all of the team for the moment, bye-bye.